I want people to understand this ordeal. It's taken a toll on both of us. Casey Anthony's parents respond after 15 years of allegations. I've gotten blamed for something I didn't do, and it tears me up inside. This can change our life. This is serious. This is their final response. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. To get the Crime Writers on After Show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, they were lauded in the publishing world for their work until they were taken down by scandal. We'll talk about the new literary true crime series, Missing Pages. Joining me to get that done and more is the author of Wicked Intentions, Our Little Secret, Legally Dead, Notes on a Killing, Dark Heart, and American Sweepstakes, my husband and the love of my life, Kevin Flynn. (laughs) Hello, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is the author of Lie After Lie, Dead on Deadline, and the upcoming The Final Curtain. Hello, Laura Bricker. (laughs) Hello, Rebecca Lavoie. And finally, the author of The Vault, Scorch City and Invisible Streets, it's Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Word up. Wow, Kevin, you wrote all of our uh, book bona fides there. I think we've written quite a bit. Yeah. I think we're in the position to, you know, say something or two. Plug some old books. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We've written a lot of crappy paperback books and... (laughs) <laughs> Kev, uh, Toby has written actual hardcover things that came out and they were like well received yeah, yeah. and they had fancy covers and yeah. stuff. Like, and then we should... they were reprint- reprinted in Polish. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right, I'm so... huge in Romania. Yeah. <laughs> As our listeners you may still have... are. <laughs> As our listeners may have noticed, we are back to our twice weekly schedule. Yay! Kevin, what is coming up on Thursday's program? Yeah, on Thursday we're going to be talking about the Netflix documentary Running with the Devil. The Wild World of John McAfee. Is that about that little pop-up that's always coming up in the corner of your computer screen? (laughs) Fuck that. You know, McAfee, you're the virus. I'd like to get you off my computer, but I can never do that. You and Mr. Norton. You install. You you blow the computer up. It still comes up saying, would you like a subscription? No. Mr. McAfee and Mr. Norton need to just go away. (laughs) <laughs> get on the lamb. So, yeah, that's what we're talking about. It's a really interesting documentary. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Kevin, can I make a quick plug, a quick like plug for something that a little side project I've been working on? Oh, sure. Why don't you do that? And so as long as we're doing that, as long as we're in the self-promotional phase. Um, well, listeners, we have a whole business section coming up, too. So <laughs> That's true. Um, so as you know, guys, uh, our wonderful son, Henry, is home and has graduated from college. And he's home from being home from Germany for the summer. And he's looking for jobs. And no, this is not a plea for any of you who are hiring to hire our son. But However, he decided that he and I should embark upon a new independent project while he is doing this. And he and I have launched an independent podcast produced by Henry Lavoie, where we critically and hilariously look at the fun and wild world of celebrity podcasts. And that podcast is called... Celebrity Podcast Podcast. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. I recommend listening to it. It's on all the platforms. There are a couple episodes out right now. In the first two episodes, we look at the podcast that apparently has been very short-lived now, uh, created by Megan Markle called Archetypes, which mm-hmm. apparently now has been put on hiatus. Thanks to the influence of The Firm, it has now been put the on firm. hiatus. <laughs> so yes, our uh, scathing review is up uh, for all posterity. And in the second episode, we talk about an interview of Billy Joel done by Alec Baldwin for his podcast, Here's the Thing. And in an upcoming episode, we will discuss 
on a deep dive, <laughs> the uh, podcast made by Gwyneth Paltrow for her lifestyle brand, Goop. So please check out Celebrity Podcast Podcast. It's super fun. It is my son's project, but it is not childish. It is actually super freaking Yeah, good. I'm going thumb sideways. <laughs> I made you listen to one. You actually liked it's actually, it. It's very, it's very, very good. It's very funny. You Henry's guys are a much funny. better producer and much funnier. <laughs> so I really recommend it. All right. Well, we have something to get to tonight. And I think in terms of the sound effect, <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> are you guys ready to talk about that? Yes. I are we talking so. about Limetown? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and drop that first clip right now. In season one of Missing Pages, I'll Be Your Guide as we look back at some of the most iconic, jaw-dropping, and just truly bizarre book scandals to shape the publishing world. To get to the top of the bestseller list takes more than just writing a good book. And going from acclaimed author to scandalous fraud can happen with the turn of a page. Like Kavya Viswanathan, the young phenom whose book contained plagiarized passages. Every week, every day, there was another passage that was lifted from somewhere. And it happened so often that I was like, why on earth would any person writing this book think they could get away with that? Or Dan Mallory, the author of The Woman in the Window, whose life of adversity was an elaborate hoax played upon the literary community. Did Bipolar 2 excuse unexplained spending on Amazon charged to the corporate American Express card? Or using his boss's computer after hours? Or that his colleagues thought he was likely the one leaving plastic cups of urine around the office. The eight-part series Missing Pages from the Podglomerate dives into stories of famous authors brought low by their misdeeds and misrepresentations. Host Beth Ann Patrick also explores the industry culture and social biases that contribute to the controversies in the first place. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from Missing Pages. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes to hear our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. Now, before we get into the content of this podcast, I just want to ask you guys, Toby, I think this is one of the best ideas for a podcast I have heard about in a very long time. What do you think of just the concept of this podcast, looking at scandals and frauds and hoaxes and gossip, frankly, from the literary industry. Yeah, I think it's a really good idea. I mean, there's a lot of material out there. I think a lot of writers like to kind of dish. <laughs> so I can mm-hmm. think that's you get an opportunity to get that. Um, I think what Beth Ann does is to try and tie these things into larger issues in the industry. And, you know, to a certain extent, I feel like we're sort of like almost the exact target audience and that we are, you know, we've all written books and, and, you know, interface with the publishing world. So we have some sense of these things. And I, at least I knew about half of the uh, cases that that were covered. So, yeah, I I think it's a great idea. I'm interested to see where she goes. They missed a chance to call it on writer's crime. (laughs) Ah. Just saying. And Kevin, of course, Beth Ann Patrick tweets as the book maven. uh, Oh, right. Yeah. A a well-known sort of figure in like Twitter literati. I I actually didn't put that together. Yeah. 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 So um, this is I am in some ways I look at this as like a lot of people could look at this and say, like, who cares? Right. Because it is a very specific niche of things that people talk about, like people who want to be writers or people who like care a lot about the publishing industry. But it is an industry that's been looked at with a lot of scrutiny in recent years. And frankly, it's a new kind of fraud and scandal that we haven't heard or seen anything about in any of the podcasts or documentaries that we've covered, right? Yeah, right. This is a nice bloodless tales of wrongdoing, which are always uh, important for our true crime genre. This is a subculture with feuds among the, or I don't want to, take toby's line i don't want to plagiarize <laughs> toby's no. line no go right ahead i give you full copyright permissions oh really so we're gonna do a package and then yeah, we're gonna exactly. have a, a feud among subcultures the movie you got it uh yeah no it's uh, again it's, it's a thing that i think the most true crime fans are probably not following industry news from publishing so the fact that there are scandals and uh, you know i don't think we have any murders coming up but Just bad behavior is always very interesting. 
Okay, so Lara, I want to start just by talking about episode two. I don't want to get to episode one in a minute only because I think that we all have stuff to say about sort of some of the structural issues with episode one. Episode two is a story I was super looking forward to hearing about. It's about Dan Mallory, Mm -hmm. who wrote as A.J. Finn. He wrote a much uh, heralded, huge bestseller called The Woman in the Window, which... A lot of people say it was sort of a ripoff of a movie, movie called Copycat, which when I read it is mm-hmm. what I thought. But It's also a ripoff of Rear Window. A ripoff of a lot of things. Yeah. However, he turns out to have been, you know, an editor at a publishing house who basically like got himself a huge book deal. Mm-hmm. But then he turns out to be this serial liar. And it's a super juicy story. Um, what did you think of just the story of Dan Mallory? Because this is the one that personally I was really looking forward to hearing. Yeah, this is someone I was looking forward to as well because I, I, you know, I remember we reviewed this on Netflix when it came out, and I believe Toby at that point had referenced because Toby's always much more well read than I am. He had read, I think, the New Yorker piece on Dan Mallory, and um, so I found it really interesting in this to hear about the fact checker who had to fact check the ten thousand word profile of Mallory. Like, oh my God, what a job that was. I have a list. <laughs> he claimed to have agoraphobia. He pretended to have a doctor from Oxford. He pretended to have a doctor in psychology. He pretended like he his did. mother died from breast cancer. His brother both died of cystic fibrosis and suicide. And the father, again, died of unspecified causes. Then he claimed himself to have an inoperable brain tumor. And he also claimed to have a tumor on his spine. Then he had a fake British accent. <laughs> and he pretended to be dog-sitting when he wasn't dog-sitting. I love a good con man story. And in this case, I think what was interesting to me is when you hear this story and some of his, well, not some of his, like many of his claims are so far-fetched that at some point you have to say, can this really be true? Like his mother died and like now this guy has a brain tumor and oh wait, he has a doctorate from Oxford. Like it just goes on and on and on. And then I guess what I was taking from it was like, okay, this is actually... You know, it's a con man story, but it's actually really a mental health story because this guy's got some major issues going on. But also, I think in like the dishing in the literary world, like we're talking about like the gossip angle and sort of this sort of behind the scenes insider view of what happened here. I guess I'm thinking like, do they ever actually fact check some of the people that they give book contracts to? Because some of these things would have been kind of things you could have checked out. But I I guess that's what's interesting to me is that the level of deception and how many people fell for it. And then I also loved that he was like all bent out of shape about the woman in the window across the street from the woman in the window. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, checking their their background, Laura, it's like I think it's hard for someone who is a you know, they're signing a college freshman or somebody who's an Instagram star but certainly a guy who has been working in the publishing industry yeah. and people say, I think he's the one leaving jars of piss all over yes. the office. You know, somebody should, th- that, that's that got to get around, right? Yeah. And I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm just more suspicious than most people because I literally do like a background check on everybody that I meet yeah. in a way. Like I'm like, oh, mm, you look nice, but I don't really believe that. So I, I don't what know. What did Toby's I, background check come up with? I, I'm, just, I'm just curious because so I feel like we all have met or have worked with a Dan Mallory, somebody yes. who constantly has a sick or dying relative in their life, somebody who constantly has like a, a, a history of traumatic stories that like cannot possibly have been strung together mm-hmm. the way that they string together, right? But yet keep failing up, yet keep that like they seem fine every time you see them, right? They're like, oh, Oh, but then you see them and they're completely fine. But yeah, and one of the things I loved about this episode, Toby, I, I actually, I strongly would have suggested if I were the editor of this podcast that this should have been episode one because one of the moments I really loved about it, and yes, it drew from a lot of other reporting, which I saw you noted, is when they when they had the woman on who wrote an article about it who basically listed 
all of the things that Dan Mallory had lied about. She was like, his mother, his father died twice. I'm getting them factually right there. (laughs) His mother had this. He faked a British accent. (laughs) He said this. He said this. You know, what do you think of this? And and I mean, there is one conclusion that the episode tries to draw, which is that there are victims of Dan Mallory, aside from the fact that he was just this fraudster. I mean, just sort of what do you think of the conclusions about that this episode tries to draw there? So, yeah. So I think one of the things that all of these episodes try and do is to make sort of a larger point about the publishing industry and maybe have some kind of insight into that actual case. Uh, Of all of them, I kind of felt like this was sort of the weakest Mm. in that the case she tries to make is that Dan Mallory's success and getting signed for this big deal and all this stuff is kind of at the expense of, you know, traditionally underrepresented people in the publishing world. Dan's exploitative behavior, in turn, may actually have removed opportunities for other writers who didn't have the same access to or understanding of the system as he did. And my my feeling is that that's not really... I mean, you could say that about just about any, like, shitty white male writer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to lie and leave urine around. She talks about it quite a bit. Like, if you go to... If you're a, you know, a well-off white male who goes to like the right schools and stuff like that's an instant leg up in the publishing industry. And I think she's talking a lot about, you know, getting jobs for publishing houses, but I think it's also the same for getting book contracts. And I guess we'll talk about that again a little bit later, not necessarily with the the male aspect, but with Carolyn Calloway, which is like, where does the money in publishing get put? And in this case, it was this, with this guy who the red flag should have been going off. Although, you know, interestingly, I don't think anybody's really, besides being derivative, I don't, and, and bad, I don't think anybody is the girl in the train has gotten any, the sort of classic literary, like plagiarism or, or whatever. Yeah. You know, you know what bothers me about the Dan Mallory story more than anything are the complete lack of consequences for Dan Mallory, right? So I look at what's happening right now with a, a director and actress, Olivia Wilde, who um, is being completely excoriated in the media. Well, at least she didn't get spat upon. Well, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> she's she's the director of this movie, Don't Worry Darling, where, you know, there's a series of sort of maybe scandals around this movie. Her, her feud, Behind allegedly, yeah. with Florence Pugh, her dating Harry Styles, interfering with the thing, her, like, begging Shia LaBeouf to be in the movie, and it's uh, this whole freaking thing. She is being freaking excoriated excoriated by Twitter, by the media. I guarantee this is going to hurt her career going forward. I guarantee it. Like her chances are going to be diminished. She'll probably get, you know, her chances are lessened. Her opportunities are going to be lessened by this. This dude was outed for lying about his entire life. And the publisher's response is, we don't respond to those kinds of things. And he's still going doing interviews. I read a book recently that he blurbed. He was a A.J. Finn was a blurb in a high profile thriller that was released. No consequences. Mm -hmm. Kevin, is this sexism? Yes or no? Yeah. I mean, it's also a a, a kind of privilege, both racial and classist. Just seems like a lot of the debut hardcover front of the store books. They're either people that like went to Ivy League schools and like, you know, exclusive MBA programs, or they're somehow connected to the people within the publishing in- industry. And workaday writers like, I don't know, the four of us aren't afforded sort of the same opportunity. We don't get the very good deals that they listen publishers lunch. So yeah, so I think that uh, A.J. Finn, Dan Mallory, whatever this douchebag's name is, you talk about like failing up. The privilege is so thick that even within the industry, he is well known to be a knucklehead that he still gets this major deal that immediately becomes like option for a crappy movie, which we all reviewed, by the way, and gave it four thumbs down. I think the other thing, though, is that there's only a handful of authors who I think people generally know their name, right? I mean, it's it's a small number compared to like a movie director or a movie actor. And then when you compound it with the fact that he's writing under a pseudonym, so people have to like make that connection as well, that I think it's easy for him, you know, even with all this privilege and stuff to kind of fly under the radar. Because I think if you said to most people, 
Dan Mallory, what a prick. People be like, oh yeah, sure. Who's that again? Yeah. Um, whereas with Olivia Wilde, they're like, oh yeah, wasn't didn't she like steal Harry Styles away from you know? I mean, yeah. it's like it's just there's like a different level of public. Didn't exposure. she cheat on Ted Lasso and then he's yeah exactly. Her paper so, on stage. <laughs> he's such he's so nice. <sighs> I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounders. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. Kevin, here we are. It's time for the business section. What have we had going on on our Patreon, Kevin? Right now, if you go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media and join us on Patreon, you can listen to the Crime Writers on After Show. It's a big show. Yeah. First of all, this is our 300th Patreon exclusive podcast. Shut your what? front door. That includes all the other great podcasts you get there, including Leave It to Bricker, Married with Podcast, Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast, and The After Show. And to celebrate, you and I are going to be lazy. Yes. And we're giving it over to Toby Ball. Toby is going to run the show. And Toby, I'm taking the helm. What are we talking about, Toby? We're going to be talking about our entry into writing. Oh, I think it's thematically it's it's sort of a oh yeah Laura Bricker's books about to come out yep and uh, we're we're talking about missing pages so I thought maybe we would talk about like how did we get our first book going mm. how did how did that all work hmm. speaking of books we've got coming up the latest episode of Toby's Deep Dive Book Club podcast Toby the book is called When the Moon Turns to Blood yep it's uh, by Leah Satilli whose podcasts we all love. We'll be listening to her in the coming weeks, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm psyched for that. So, yeah, Janet Varney and Sarah D. Bunting and Amber Hunt and I had a great talk about the book. There's a lot of... uh, We talk both about the stuff that's in the book, but also some of the roadblocks or challenges that Leah faced when she's writing about a crime when the trial hasn't actually happened. Yeah, yeah. So that there's a lot of facts that are unknown that may at some point be known. I mean, some sometimes they're, they're never found out. Yeah. But anyway, so I, I think there's sort of a good sort of two-pronged conversation we have. Nice. Two things happening outside of the podcast world here. One, we want to let you know that Rebecca and I will be at Obsessed Fest. Yes. That's in Columbus, Ohio, September 30th and October 1st and 2nd. We're going to be doing all sorts of stuff. There's a Kevin and Rebecca meet and greet. We're going to be doing a live recording of These Are Their Stories, the on order podcast plus rebecca is going to be doing panels with robbie ashadri amber hunt maggie freeling i'm going to be talking to the guys from generation y yeah i was about to say that generation y plus we're also going to be talking with Payne Lindsay for an hour on stage me and Payne. my an goodness hour yes jesus lastly want to tell you that again this year i am going to be walking a mile in her shoes haven't been able to do this in the past couple it's of back. years because of the pandemic. You still have those shoes? I still have the shoes. Nice. Yes, they're actually right outside the door here. What's oh. going to happen is that I am going to put on a pair of high heel shoes. And after all these years, I still cannot walk in them. Nope. And I will walk a mile. I'm, I'm doing this in scare quotes, a mile. <laughs> <laughs> in these shoes to raise money for the uh, Central New Hampshire Crisis Center. And if you can... Donate and uh, sponsor my walk. There's going to be a link at crimewriterson.com. It's a great cause. Yeah, it's a great cause. It's a little cause. If you can't do it here, do it where you are. Do something for the cause closer to home, but we would certainly love a couple of bucks so that we can help out the folks here in New Hampshire. Yes. All right, Kevin. Uh, does thus end the business section? Thus ends the business section. All right. I'm going to fade that music out right now. 
Okay, so let's talk about episode one of this podcast because I see in all of our notes that we all agree that there is some serious storytelling flaws in what could have otherwise been a very interesting story. Uh, this is the story of a Harvard student named Kavya Visnawathan who allegedly plagiarized her first novel for which she got a $500,000 book deal. I seem to, when I was listening to it, I found myself continuously rewinding, thinking I must have missed something mm -hmm. yeah. because they never actually explain in the podcast what the incident of plagiarism was, what book she allegedly plagiarized from, how many passages. Uh, what Just the author's name. They, they, they mention the author's name. They talk to the Crimson reporter who reported on it. They mention it, an interview she did with a Today Show about it, but they don't play any excerpts of what the allegations were. They never, and I don't know if it was cut for legal reasons. I don't know if there were edits made for other reasons. But this was a huge editing flaw in this otherwise what could have been a great episode because they actually got an interview with Kavya, which was a coup, which is why I think they put this episode as number one in the order. But this was hugely problematic. At first, this was an unforced error for the story. Maybe it was a forced error. I don't know. Kevin, what did you think about this when you listened to it? Yeah, I mean, I think that what happens with a lot of these episodes, to me, it doesn't feel like they have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? You know, I can tell you what each author was accused of, but I really don't have a deep understanding of what happened. Ironically, it just feels like missing pages has some missing pages. So for in the in the example that... Yes. <laughs> I do love that sound yeah. effect. Though. <laughs> Look, in the episode you talk about, right, why can't we go into the actual plagiarism, right? I don't have a sense, like, you know, for what was copied, did Lou Skywalker and Dan Solo go out and try to rescue a princess or, you know, why can't we actually get into, I have no idea the scope. They, they said, it, they never named the book. They named the author, but yeah. they never named the books right. from which she allegedly. Right. Well, they keep saying, well, you know, at the Crimson Review, you know, at the newspaper, like then like more and more revelations came out. They don't tell us what those revelations, what revelations? were. They don't build it up like that. Uh, and they say like, Oh, well, this Today Show interview was a disaster. We didn't hear the disaster. There's a lot of telling and no showing, and I don't know why that is. Now, Laura, this is stuff you can literally Google, right? Yeah. Did you do that? I didn't Google that in this one because I guess I wasn't that interested in that particular story, okay. except that I was, <laughs> but I was frustrated because I was like, okay, same as everybody else. I was listening and I'm like, I mean, I thought it was really interesting in this particular story about book packaging and how the publishing industry gets what they consider marketable people to write books and they package it. And I thought that was so interesting. And that's how she came to write this book and that they might have coached her a little bit on what to do. But then I was like, OK, I, I was waiting and I'm like and then they had the interview with her and I'm like, huh. So that was it. And they're like, oh, thank you so much for like joining us and everything. Yeah. And they didn't really press like, her, yeah. They never no, draw the line, like, right. Yeah, I was like, okay, it was kind of flat, the interview. I was expecting a little bit more, like, well, where did you get this idea? Where did you, and, but I don't know what the ideas were because I didn't, yeah. So that, that I, I agree, that was, um, I think we all sort of agree on that. That was definitely a hole in this episode. Toby, they never, like, so the book packaging stuff was very interesting. Yeah. Whatever happened with Kavi, I'm sure, was very interesting, but we never heard what it actually was. And I think the premise of the episode was supposed to be that whatever happened in this book packaging situation and who maybe whoever this mysterious editor was that they just drop for a second that this one editor was mentioned here and was mentioned here and then they just drop it. I think that the episode maybe at some point in an earlier version was going to draw a more direct line between the book packaging and whatever it was Kavya was accused of doing. But then I don't know why the final product doesn't draw that line. It felt to me like there were parts that were in there that were taken out. And then in the final edit, it didn't occur to the people putting this podcast together like, we have to re-edit this so it actually makes sense to a new listener, right? Yeah. I mean, I kind of felt like there was a couple that seemed like they were, they kind of had a like under the gun feeling to me. Like mm. they were trying to get them done at a certain time. I think maybe it was the fourth or fifth one, the part two of the two part one. Also, I think had some things that made me think, well, they, they ran out of time yes. uh, to, to get it right. Yeah. I, it, it was a frustrating episode and, and I, and I kind of got, the feeling that part of it was sort of helping to clear Kavya's name and 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 sort of show that she wasn't fully responsible for this. But again, you don't really know what the accusation is. And then they also, it's like Harvard cleared you. 
It's like, like on what wait, basis? Wait, what they so they pulled the it was like strong enough that they pulled the book, but then Harvard like looked into it and they said it was fine. And then it's like, what are the differences between what like a publishing house looks at for plagiarism and what a university looks at for plagiarism? Are those two different things? So they're they're using two different criteria. They found you innocent of plagiarism. That's what you just said, correct? Yeah, they they did. They're independent. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it was never public, of course, but. Right, no, but I mean, no, but now it is. It was one of those things where I just ended up with all these questions. Mm. Like if I was a producer and I listened to it, like I would have a bunch of notes being like, you got to clarify this stuff because it doesn't really make sense right now. It felt like there wasn't a final ear on it to me. Well, I did think that the whole segment about book packaging was interesting to me. And I think to the average listener, too. I mean, how else does James Patterson write 15 fucking books a year? Right? He, doesn't. He's, he does it. Right. And there are there are a lot of elements within the entertainment industry in which agents sort of leverage their professional relationships between like the artists that they have and the producers and the studios and the whatnot to make stuff happen. But you can't always be sure it benefits all the parties. Like, I'll tell you about like a, a, an author I know had a book come out or is about to come out, true crime book. His agent uh, made a deal with this this TV producer to do a TV series based on the book. And now, did that author, because the agent is representing both sides, did he get the most aggressive deal that he possibly could have gotten? Can't say. Then when the production company decides they're not going to go through with the book, he doesn't get any money because even though they bought the story, they decide to welch on it and the agent doesn't go and get the money. Now, I'm not saying I was that person, but I'm just saying <laughs> that, you know, you, you can't always be certain that everybody's working in your best interest. Nope, you uh-huh. cannot. I'm saying that person actually may have been better off with a book packaging company in that instance. I don't know. Um, so I, the other thing is that that was just an Irish guy giving the Welsh a piece of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> isn't That's it, racist, isn't it, Kevin. Is it, isn't isn't Welshing somebody like referring to the Welsh from Wales? I think it's referring to grapes, personally. I, well, I don't know. Gra- <laughs> grape jelly. You grape jelly them again. Um, <laughs> grape jelly them. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I, I, I do want to talk about the Carolyn Calloway episodes because yeah. while this story was juicy, I did read the article in the cut. I followed this story when it was happening. I do think two episodes was basically turned this story into like a little bit of a gossip fest. I'm just going to say it felt a little bit gleeful to me going after this uh, young person who clearly like made some, but seemed to me young person (laughs) mistakes. However, and I will say there was also, as Toby pointed out, a huge unforced editing error in one of these episodes (laughs) where Beth Ann literally repeats a line where she says, not good as publishers lunch might write. Not good. <laughs> There's like, like a couple of things like that in these episodes, and I'm just like, yeah, oh. not on her, on the editor. That's the editor. Yes, just, oh, just yeah. like for goodness sakes, <laughs> just like so, like third year would really help with this. Laura, what did you think of the story? Like, like t- let's take the sort of fact that it was two long episodes out of it, but what yeah. did you think of the Callaway story just as a story? This is like the Anna Delvey of the publishing world, in a way, uh, the Anna Delvey Instagram. And I was very interested when I found out she went to school in Exeter. I'm like, oh my goodness. Now I can't wait until I'm at some sort of little Phillips Exeter get together and I can find out who I know that had her as a student and what she was like when she was here. So that's that was my initial, you know, thing. But I I was kind of like, okay, the Wildflower Crown subscription box, like I can get behind (laughs) that. Um, the snake oil lotion for the face. I can get behind can that. Can you believe they never even acknowledged <laughs> the fact that her thing is called snake oil? Like that was never even yeah. nodded at yeah. the podcast. <laughs> oh my God. But I was like, hey, I mean, good for her. I mean, she certainly was industrious and ambitious and wanted to make some money. But I, you know, I think I just, I don't think it needed to be two episodes. There was some, pe- I, you know, I thought it was interesting this one did turn a little more gossipy. I mean, we had the people talking about what it was like when she was out and, you know, she had people around her and what the scene was socially when she was out and about with people. And, you know, I I thought she was interesting. I I just, I don't think she needed two episodes personally. Do you think this was a literary fraud, Toby, or just like a sign the publishing industry is broken? Yeah. Uh, And I actually think that Carolyn Calloway, of all the things that people we listen to, 
you know, she sounds like a young person with some mental health issues is what she sounds like to me. A little bit of narcissism. Obviously, her father died by suicide, which is like super tragic. It sounds like she spent a lot of time away from home as a kid. But, you know, she did end up graduating from a very prestigious college. So she's no dummy. Um, and it did seem like a little gleeful to me the way that, you know, this episode really reveled in going at her, as did the articles. By the way, the article by her friend in the cut who said that she was her, great article. Recommend that more so than listening to this episode about her. Uh, what, what did you think of her story, though, Toby? So, I, you know, I think we could all attest about how glamorous it is to be a, an author. I mean, it was... <laughs> it's very glamorous. They, yeah, very it keeps getting glamour. held up as like an aspiration, right? And I can, I'm like, who wants to be this like so bad? Yeah, cool. well, I, I think I knew people, women who like thought Donna Tart like inhabiting that space like held a lot of sort of whatever fanciness fanciness uh that one guy talks about how when she's sort of conceiving of herself or, or her comparisons to herself are to like Joan Didion and like all all these other sort of glamorous uh, women who wrote memoirs who sort of enhance their sort of standing I guess in the public eye in a way that I she probably felt was sort of more in keeping with being a Cambridge graduate than just having half a billion Instagram followers or whatever it was million, she had. Half a million. Half a million. All Which right, whatever. It isn't really that many these days. Uh, it's a lot. I've got like 43, I think. I know. So, <laughs> I, know. I mean, it's a lot. I, 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 I might have more if I ever posted. Part of what I thought was interesting, which is part of it, but not a huge part of it, is the fact that having 500,000 Instagram followers means you're attractive to the publishing industry, which to me just seems like, what are you buying? What you're buying is a guaranteed, like you're expecting that a percentage of the people who follow her will buy her book, regardless of whether she's a good writer. And so if you have half a million people and say even, you know, 8% of them buy the book that's like 40,000 books selling. So that that's successful. So that's a calculation that's being made. It has nothing to do with whether she can write hmm. when there's sort of like, like taking a look at the, at the publishing industry at large and using this as like sort of an illustrating case. I thought this was like the strongest aspect of that. Cause then they talked to that, that woman who had written for 20 years and finally broke through in a huge way but, you know, didn't get a huge advance, but then, you know, got picked up by HBO or Netflix or whatever. But her having sort of a more traditional and like a career arc that's based on her, actually the quality of her writing and her working on her craft all this time right. and not trying to accumulate Instagram followers, which include, by the way, buying some, yep. which, you know, whatever. As she says, Beth Ann says that that's not necessarily sketchy, but- it is, in my opinion. It, seems, it feels a little bit that way. Yeah, non-organic accumulation of audience, in my opinion, is extremely sketchy if you're a content creator. That is a way that I feel. I feel very strongly about that, personally. Um, I don't want to take too much more time talking about the content, so I want to run quickly through the last couple of episodes. Um, Kevin, the Anna March episode, uh, you really enjoyed this episode, right? Yeah, that's the episode that's coming out today. This is about... I, well, one of the reasons why I think that it's the strongest one is that Beth Ann has firsthand experience with this person, Anna March, who is, you know, kind a of a fraudster, com another fraudster. Uh, she has Anne Frank's concentration camp tattoo as her tattoo. Yes. Which is a little fucked up. Super fucked up. Uh, but I think this one could have come maybe sooner. Episode two. I think it should have been episode, episode two. two? Yeah, I, I think mean, it should have been Dan Mallory and then this. I, I do think I understand like why you'd hold it back because we really don't know Beth Ann yet as a host. And so the value of this being her experience might you know, might be wasted too early on, but I thought that was a that was a much stronger episode than some of the other ones. I agree. I would have put that this. I would have put Dan Mallory just because because people want to hear it. Then mm -hmm. this episode because it was such a strong episode, and then I would have put Kavia's episode next after a stronger edit of that episode. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I definitely think the order of things here was unfortunate. Um, Toby, maybe what a stronger edit was the problem. Yeah, Toby, what did you think of the JT Leroy episode? You know, I actually, I, I like this one a lot. I'd certainly read a lot about it. I, I knew a fair amount about the story. I thought the discussion they had at the end where they're basically like, so what? I mean, it's fiction. 
like plenty of people write under pseudonyms. Exactly. Like what, what's the problem here? And to a certain extent, it's like, I don't know. I, I, I feel like usually pseudonyms though are not quite that extreme or, or like trying to put themselves forward. It's like this guy, Dan Mallory. It's like, I'm going to write under AJ Finn, but I'm not going to pretend I'm like, uh, you know, an orphan from Vietnam writing about my experience. Right. I mean, it's just like, it's just another white guy name that he's going to use where it's, she was really putting herself forward as a complete different kind of person to add authenticity to these, to these stories that she's writing. But in the end, I mean, I think there's, there's a strong case to be made and it's certainly to me in the end, like even if it leaves kind of a bad taste in your mouth, the like scandal that it became does seem like a little overblown Hmm. uh, compared to, you know, it's just pushing the boundaries a little bit on that stuff. I I, I completely agree. It almost seemed like performance art to me, like especially the performing in the band on the book tour. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Laura, one of the things that I really enjoyed about that episode was hearing that the producer actually got in touch with her, with Laura, is it Laura? Mm -hmm. And that, that, that the communication became like relentless and that really gave them a sense that this person, you know, had some serious issues. Like that was a window, right? Into that, like perhaps this person was really like, like the way that we went after them was not really looking at who they actually were the same way they were getting scrutiny in the same level that maybe like a Dan Mallory should be getting scrutiny and not really telling the complete story about why this person may have, you know, gone on this journey and done the things that that they did. Yeah, I think honestly, for me, that was sort of the takeaway from this whole podcast from each of the stories that we heard. I feel like Each of these people had something mental health related that was going on that was contributing to why they were behaving the way they were with regard to their publishing journey. I mean, so the JT Leroy one, I mean, you know, it made to me perfect sense that this is somebody that had a lot of trauma in their childhood and dissociated. And that is how this alternate sort of side of them developed as a way to process the trauma. And and that made perfect sense. I mean, I guess the thing about that one that kind of bothered me a little bit is that like, really, it was somebody that was using a pen name. Honestly, it wasn't like it was plagiarized. It was somebody that was using a pen name. And that was basically writing this story that they had been writing since they were much younger, as a way to process what happened to them. And I think, you know, everybody has their own reasons for revealing or not revealing what inspires them to write something. And perhaps they just honestly didn't feel safe enough to put themselves in a vulnerable position to be like, yeah, this was me. And this is how I dealt with it by writing this story. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, cause that one out of all of them, I was like, I felt honestly the most sympathetic in that one. I didn't feel as sympathetic, you know, Mallory pissing in cups at work. No, thank you. But (laughs) I, I did feel like with this particular story that there was a lot more there to unpack about what had happened to this person that resulted in this story coming onto the page from their mind, from their own personal experience, but that there was definitely a lot of trauma and mental health at play here. So I felt a lot more sympathy in this particular case. I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Oh, man. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. The friendship is sharing deal because I want one of your McNuggets and I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. All right, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out the new podcast, 
<laughs> missing pages. From it's the- not crumpled. They just like turn the page. I know, but it's, it's the closest I can replicate here. Oh, right. I actually, I love the sound effect. I think it's really jaunty. Uh, from the podglomerate, the podcast is missing pages. Laura Bricker, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for this podcast? So this is going to be a thumbs up, but it's not going to be like a hugely enthusiastic thumbs up, but it's a thumbs up because I think it's really interesting. Like who doesn't want to know? I mean, I guess me, I want to know the inside world of the book publishing industry and the literary world. And this is definitely told by somebody who's an insider who knows everybody and can get access to people that have the story behind the story. My issue was I felt like um, the structure sometimes got a little bit bogged down, like it was broken up in chapters. To me, I still felt there was sometimes pieces missing that would have brought more to the story. But overall, I mean, I guess I just thought it was really interesting. This is very unique. It's not something we've heard about before. And I do love a good literary story. Toby Ball. Yeah, you know, we don't generally review things like this where it's a different story every week. And, you know, I, I kind of feel like this this has some growing pains. My sort of hope and assumption is that it will sort of smooth those things out as time goes on. As it was, I think I found parts of all the episodes interesting. I thought there were some really good insights. So I, I'm, I'm a thumbs up. Again, I, I think it's it's a little bit qualified, but I expect that as things go on, that and as they iron out these little uh, wrinkles that they have, it'll be excellent. There's certainly a lot of stories, and I think Beth Ann is probably a good person to be telling those stories. Kevin Flynn. I'm going to have to go thumbs sideways. I can't really go thumbs down. It's imperfect. Toby's right that, you know, the, the reason why we don't usually do podcasts that are a different story each week is that, I mean, what's the batting average end up going to be? Because you might have a really great, might a really strong first episode and then rotten stuff on the back end. And it's kind of hard to do that. I think in general, my my issue is that sometimes it feels like they had 25 minutes of story and only 45 minutes to to tell it in. Mm. And there just seemed to be so many narrative holes. I don't feel like for whatever reason we got, not just like you didn't get the whole story, but it's a little like Swiss cheese. Narratively, I I don't understand what really happened in a couple of these cases. Yep. And so for me, that's my frustration. As a listener, I'm frustrated by that. So, uh, but it's not horrible. I mean, they did get some good interviews. Some of the side stuff, as far as digging into topics about can a story by a cisgender author be canonical transgender literature? What about white privilege? What about the industry itself? Uh, th- these diversions were good, but at some point they end up becoming filler because there's not enough there, there. A little too much telling, not, an, not enough showing. So just sideways for me. Okay. So I, was on the brink of sideways or up, but I'm deciding to go up. Okay. Uh, mild thumbs up. This is the best idea for a podcast I've heard in a very long time. The editing errors and production errors are so unfortunate. Uh, the Swiss cheese issue in episode one is glaring. It's really, really glaring. And I wish a third party had listened to it. It would have caught that. A third party would have caught every error in this podcast. Repeated tape, repeated points. This was cheese nature of some of the storytelling. That being said, the good parts are so good and so juicy. And there are stories here I want to hear. The episodes are too long. They did not need to be as long as that they were. Mm -hmm. It does feel like the points were hammered, 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 hammered. All of this is editing. It's all editing. That being said, the core material is so good and the idea is so good. And the parts I enjoyed listening to, I enjoyed listening to enough that I cannot give this podcast a thumb sideways or a thumbs down. I have to end up with thumbs up because I really enjoyed listening to it. I, I would not be so frustrated by its flaws if I didn't enjoy it so much, if that makes sense. So yeah, thumbs up for me, ultimately, for Missing Pages. All right, now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something I like to call the crime of the week. week. As we observe Queen Elizabeth's funeral today, there is another important tradition which is performed in Her Majesty's honor. The royal beekeeper has formally notified the hives of the queen's death and informed them King Charles is now their master. This tradition dates back centuries. It's based on a superstition that if the bees are not informed of the monarch's passing, they will stop producing honey. 
After their caretaker broke the news to the hive in somber, hushed tones, he draped them in black bows. The honeymaker seemed to be taking it well, considering there's now only one queen bee among them. And why shouldn't they be informed? After all, this was the crown's only remaining colony. Oh, that stings. So, panel, these bees certainly like to keep up on current events. What other news reports should they hear about? Laura Bricker, what do you think? I mean, I think they should definitely be listening to Crime Writers On. Hmm. Yeah, I think so, too. Toby Ball, what other news reports should these bees be hearing about? I'd be keeping them up to date in the polling coming out of Pennsylvania, which has got Senate and gubernatorial races this year. That's true. That's true. Yeah. What do you think, Kevin? I think they, they should know more about what's going on with Meghan Markle's podcast. 100%. Is Why it does on? it sound like it's a Zoom call? Is it off? They're getting $100 million from Spotify or whoever the fuck. 100% yeah. though. Is, is Charles going to nix it? Is he going to be successful in nixing it ultimately? What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. <laughs> All right. That should probably do it for us. Laura Bricker, if folks want to reach out to you and find out more about your horseback riding adventures and see all of those incredible photos and videos you are posting, how can they find you on Twitter? They can find me at Lara Bricker. And Toby Ball, if folks want to follow you on Twitter and find out more about your literary adventures, how can they find you? At Toby Ball NH. Kevin Flynn, how can folks find you? I'm at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. Follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On and please join our incredible supportive community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. Support the show at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You'll get the Crime Writers On After Show, Married with Podcast, Laura Bricker's Leave It to Bricker podcast, and Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcasts. Our theme song was composed and performed Formed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the very handsome Olivia Burdett. The executive producer of this program is Kevin P. Flynn. This show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, The Closet, in our New Hampshire basement, where we may not have been on the bestseller list, but at least we've written all of our goddamn books ourselves. On behalf of all Eat the crime it. writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. Later. Hold on, I'm going to send one tweet back to Carvel. Carvel? And my, Are they uh, sponsoring us? No, Carvel Wallace. Oh. I am Cookie Opus! Today. <laughs> mm. Right, Cookie Boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fudgy I, the whale. It's a whale of a cake for a whale of a dad. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I like the ice cream cakes. Oh, they're fucking delicious. Yeah, Carvel. But they had that guy. It's Tom that Carvel. Voice. Tom Cookie Carvel. Buzz. He literally sounds like he just rolled out of bed. Smokes a six pack and is now voicing his ads. He smoked Order. a six pack. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the way Tom Carvel rolled. Yeah, bullet brown bonnet. Thornton <laughs> whiskey. He's a pro. <laughs> Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.